For generations, science fiction has challenged notions of what humans can achieve and stirred up humanity's deepest and most existential questions like, what is life? And what could happen if we had the power to control it or alter it? Well, these questions are no longer confined to just science fiction, thanks to a revolutionary gene editing technique called CRISPR. It's garnered a lot of press recently after its two discoverers, Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel Charpentier, were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, making them the only two women to have ever jointly received the honor, and only the sixth and seventh women to have ever won it in its 119-year history. But despite their groundbreaking research, Dr. Doudner and Professor Charpentier have been locked in a turbulent litigation battle to patent the CRISPR method for human cells pretty much since it was discovered back in 2012. But before we get into that, CRISPR has been touted as the most important biotech discovery of the century, yet most people don't really know how it works or even what it is really. So we're going to take a look at it. Gene editing isn't exactly a new technology. I mean, humans have been doing it for thousands of years through selective breeding. That's why the modern banana no longer has large seeds running through it, or why watermelons are now big, sweet, and juicy, as opposed to being small and bitter tasting, and why our pet dogs look more like this rather than this. Selective breeding allowed humans to exploit favorable mutations in the genomes of these organisms, and over time, and I mean a lot of time, these mutations became germline mutations, or hereditary traits, that resulted in the crops and domesticated animals we see today. These mutations occur in genes, and every living thing from single-cell bacteria to complex multicellular organisms are defined by their genes. And the DNA sequences within these genes are kind of like chapters in an instruction manual for cells. See, DNA molecules are made up of four nitrogenous bases, and these bases form base pairs, and genes are basically unique and specific sequences of these base pairs located along the DNA molecule. And they tell our cells how to do their jobs and essentially form the basis of every trait we have. So imagine if we could delve into this DNA instruction manual, pick out certain chapters, or in this case, genes, and change or even replace them. This idea is the foundation behind gene editing technology, and CRISPR is widely regarded as the most efficient, accurate, and perhaps more significantly, the most cost-effective method to accomplish this. But believe it or not, CRISPR is in fact an entirely natural phenomenon, and was first observed in 1987 in E. coli bacteria by Dr. Yoshizumi Ishino and his colleagues at Osaka University in Japan. While investigating other gene processes in E. coli, Ishino accidentally stumbled upon five identical segments of DNA separated by other blocks of DNA called spacers. But unlike the repeating segments, each spacer had a unique sequence. It was unlike anything biologists had ever seen before. And when Ishino's team published its findings, it simply stated that the biological significance of these sequences was not known. In the following years, newer technology allowed for faster DNA sequencing, and similar patterns were observed in other bacteria and single-cell systems. By 2002, microbiologists Ruud Janssen and Francisco Mojica dubbed these uniquely patterned sequences as clustered, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, also known as, thankfully, CRISPR for short. They also discovered that these CRISPR sequences were always accompanied by a collection of genes, which they ended up referring to as CRISPR-associated genes, or CAS genes. These CAS genes encoded enzymes, which are types of proteins, that could actually slice through DNA molecules, although no one could figure out why. Until 2005, when three independent teams of scientists realized that the DNA within those CRISPR spaces closely resembled those of different viruses. It was this discovery that led to the hypothesis that CRISPR and its associated Cas enzymes were in fact a defense system against viral infection and that bacteria used these Cas enzymes to cut out fragments of DNA from viruses that the cell had previously encountered and insert them into their own CRISPR spaces so they were prepared in case the virus returned. It's almost like these DNA spaces served as 
wanted posters for viruses, so when there was a viral invasion, the Cas enzymes would recognize their targets based on their DNA sequences, then swoop in and take them out. This hypothesis was tested in 2007 by French microbiologist Rodolphe Barangeau, who introduced strains of viruses into bacteria used to ferment milk for dairy products. Now, a lot of the bacteria ended up dying, but some survived, and when they multiplied, it turned out that their descendants were resistant to those viruses, indicating a genetic change. Barangeau and his team discovered that the now resistant bacteria had, in fact, stuffed DNA fragments from those viruses into its spaces, and that if they removed these new spaces, the bacteria lost its resistance. This proved that CRISPR sequences and their associated Cas genes and enzymes were in fact part of a natural defense system that used gene editing to protect bacteria from viral infection. But now the question was, how exactly did these Cas enzymes know where to make the cuts? Fast forward to October 2010, when a relatively unknown French microbiologist presented new findings at a CRISPR meeting in the Netherlands. Emmanuel Charpentier and her team had discovered that Cas proteins were actually guided to their desired locations by two types of RNA that worked in tandem. Now, RNA is a molecule that has a lot of functions and is closely related to DNA. But in this context, RNA is responsible for transcribing the data collected from the spacer segments of viral DNA. It would then bind itself to a Cas enzyme and would essentially act as a guide, informing the protein where it needed to go and what part of an invading virus's DNA needed to be snipped to kill it off. In 2011, at a microbiology conference in Puerto Rico, Charpentier met structural biologist Jennifer Doudner of the University of California, who specializes in RNA studies. And pretty soon, they were collaborating. Their resulting work was published in June 2012. Using the Cas9 protein, which is now the most widely used enzyme in CRISPR methodology, Doudner and Charpentier were able to create their own guide RNAs in the lab. When binded with the Cas9, it would essentially program the enzyme to locate any specific gene in a cell's DNA sequence, and then, kind of like a pair of genetic scissors, the protein would cut the DNA at the site specified by the customizable guide RNA. Once the cut was made, the cell would employ proteins called nucleases to trim the frayed ends and join them back together in a process called non-homologous end joining. But these kind of repairs can be unpredictable and are prone to mistakes, often lacking required base pairs. The resulting genes can be rendered unusable and are consequently turned off. However, Doudner and Charpentier were able to add a separate sequence of DNA template along with the Cas9 and guide RNA system. This DNA template essentially serves as a blueprint that guides cellular proteins to perform a different repair process called homology-directed repair. This way, they can effectively repair defective genes or even insert entirely new ones. Doudner and Charpentier had managed to transform a complex but natural defense mechanism that protected bacteria from viral infection into a powerful and customizable tool that could genetically edit DNA however you wanted. It's difficult to overstate just how significant this discovery really was. The possibilities are literally endless. With CRISPR, you can genetically edit crops to be resistant to certain pests, or be more carbon absorbent, or even grow larger fruits and vegetables for higher yields. In fact, there are ongoing studies to edit the genes in certain mosquitoes so they can no longer carry malaria. It also allows scientists to test what can happen when you activate or deactivate certain genes or insert foreign DNA in their place. But most importantly, CRISPR allows us to fix DNA which means it can be used to create treatments for diseases that are linked to genetic errors, such as cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. Or perhaps it could be used to reprogram cancer cells that have become resistant to treatment. It's why Doudner and Charpentier were awarded with the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, among a myriad of other accolades they've earned over the years since their discovery. But despite their groundbreaking work, They've both been in a continuous litigation battle to patent the CRISPR-Cas9 methodology, one that still rages today, even after their Nobel Prize win. In late January 2013, Jennifer Doudner and her team at the University of California published a paper that confirmed that the CRISPR-Cas9 technique could be applied to human cells. However, a paper that documented the same findings had already been submitted for publishing in December 2012. 
This paper was compiled by renowned Chinese-American biochemist Dr. Feng Zhang and his team at the Broad Institute at MIT. So began a nasty litigation battle over who owns the rights to the CRISPR-Cas9 method in human cells, which obviously has serious implications for licensing fees, royalties, and potentially whose fingers are in which billion dollar pies. The University of California and the University of Vienna, which is where Charpentier was working at at the time, were the first to file patents on the gene editing process. But the Broad Institute paid to have its patent application fast-tracked. So, by April 2014, the US Patent and Trademark Office awarded a number of patents to the Broad Institute, which prompted the University of California to file for an interference claim. But by 2016, the whole debacle turned even nastier when the president and founding director of the Broad Institute, Eric Lander, published an article in Cell Journal titled The Heroes of CRISPR. Now, it focused primarily on the achievements of the men whose work was instrumental in the field of gene editing, especially in the lead up to CRISPR methodology, while also downplaying the roles of Doudner and Charpentier. It also highlights Dr. Zhang as the hero responsible for exploring CRISPR in human cells. Naturally, the article received its fair share of backlash, and not only because of the obvious conflict of interest, but there was a lot of focus on the apparent sexist agenda in Lander's essay. Now, acknowledgement in science can be a tricky thing, as scientific progress is, in itself, iterative in nature. Unfortunately, science does have a long history of undermining the achievements of women. It's often led to an unequal distribution of wealth, power and influence, and at times, even a complete lack of acknowledgement of women involved in some breakthrough discoveries. Much of the backlash focused on the fact that Lander's essay was yet another example of a powerful man actively seeking to diminish the achievements of women under the guise of crediting everyone who contributed in varying degrees. Certainly, Doudner and Charpentier's Nobel Prize win does alleviate some of those concerns and hopefully points the scientific community in a more inclusive and progressive direction. But despite this, the US Patent Trial and Appeal Board ruled that the group led by the Broad Institute had priority in its already granted patents, and especially those of CRISPR in human cells. But the ruling also gives the Doudner and Charpentier side a significant leg up in patents concerning other uses of CRISPR. But the mixed rulings haven't calmed the litigation battle as both sides are still fighting. But many of the major players involved have gone on to found their own gene editing organizations and research centers that are making them a heap of money. And that says something about the nature of regulation. Despite the ongoing patent battles, advances in CRISPR technology have essentially exploded since Doudner and Charpentier's paper in 2012. The CRISPR train quickly overtook international regulatory biotech laws that were just outdated. And given the capability of CRISPR, it's clear that there's a whole host of ethical questions surrounding its advancement, and unfortunately, it's already led to some seriously unethical practices. On November 25, 2018, the MIT Technology Review broke the story of a young Chinese researcher named He Zhang Kui, who had allegedly created the world's first CRISPR-edited babies. Just three days later, he confirmed the allegations himself at an international summit on human genome editing in Hong Kong. Twin girls, Lulu and Nana, had been carried to term, and a third child was reportedly on the way. In his presentation, He explained that he had chosen couples where the fathers had HIV and the mothers didn't, and that he had used CRISPR to introduce a naturally occurring genetic mutation in the embryos that would grant them immunity to HIV. Now, because it was done in the embryos, it means it affected the germline, which also means that the mutations from his experiment would be hereditary and could potentially be passed down to future generations. He argued that it was a necessary experiment in the global effort to eradicate HIV. Yet, his actions sent shockwaves through the global scientific community, and he was immediately criticized from all directions. And as further details of his experiment were revealed, it became clear that he and his team had ignored plenty of ethical practices, including inadequate testing on mice and monkeys, no publications of his studies, no peer reviews, and just straight up lying to participants. But perhaps most importantly, his methods of testing, whether the experiment was a success or not, were just not up to scratch. In fact, many scientists present at the conference pointed out that the experiment probably didn't work, and that at least one of the twins may have succumbed to mosaicism, 
which means part of their genes may have gained a mutation, but not all of them, and that there could be a chance of extraneous, unintended mutations that may manifest further down the line. And this point is important. The truth is, there are still so many things we don't know about the human genome. The average human DNA molecule has about 20,000 genes and is made up of about 3 billion base pairs. Remember, the DNA molecule is kind of like an instruction manual that tells proteins and cells what to do, except about 98% of it is written in gibberish. Seriously, almost 98% of our DNA is officially classified as junk DNA. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean it's useless, it just means that scientists haven't come to a consensus as to what exactly certain segments of our DNA does, or if they even do anything at all. There is still considerable experimentation and testing needed to fully appreciate the potential effects that editing specific genes can have on the rest of the DNA molecule. So, yeah, experimenting on the human germline could have unexpected consequences that we cannot fully understand or even try to predict. Also, not to mention the fact that CRISPR, despite being the most cost-effective and accessible than other gene editing techniques, still doesn't have a 100% success rate. It's certainly improved a lot since it was discovered in 2012, and there are now several ongoing studies into various Cas proteins that could deliver better results, but with our current technology, any cuts or insertions made into a DNA molecule are permanent. There's no going back. Even in somatic gene edits, which are edits that don't affect the human germline, like the ones currently used in genetic therapies and medication. Consequently, there has been a global push from scientists around the world for a moratorium on CRISPR editing human embryos since March of 2019. A number of CRISPR pioneers, including Emmanuel Charpentier, Feng Zhang, Eric Lander, are all backing this moratorium. In 2017, an International Committee on Human Gene Editing even published a book on the science, ethics and governance of human genome editing because gene editing laws around the world were just simply outdated and cannot account for the complexities and ramifications of CRISPR technology. Zhang Kuai was eventually arrested by Chinese authorities for illegal medical practices and is currently serving a three-year prison sentence along with a pretty hefty fine of about $430,000. But his actions have definitely left a stain on CRISPR's legacy, but perhaps an inevitable one. There still seems to be a stigma around genetically modified fruits and vegetables, even though we've been consuming them for decades. And there was once a time when people feared and stigmatized in vitro fertilization or test tube babies. Now that technology is widely accepted and it's helped millions of parents have healthy children around the world. The truth is that as advanced and impressive as CRISPR technology is, we're still a long way away from designer babies or human enhancements or genetically modified super soldiers. Currently, CRISPR is being used to advance medicine and genetic therapies. And in time, we could potentially eradicate all genetic disorders. We could cure blindness or deafness or even prevent autism. But at some point, commercial interest is bound to transcend the medical world. And CRISPR's accessibility, despite being one of its major pros, could also be one of its biggest cons. We would then require some pretty robust regulatory laws to ensure it doesn't end up in the wrong hands or in the wrong markets. Regardless, CRISPR is a technology for the future and could one day make science fiction a reality. Over thousands of years, humans have evolved to create tools and continually improve them. And CRISPR is essentially just another tool. In fact, it's one that's a product of natural evolution. The difference, however, is that this specific tool could one day determine our own evolution. The question is, will we be responsible enough to wield such power? Thanks for watching another episode of Overlooked. I just want to clarify that the scientists we pictured from Eric Lander's essay were indeed instrumental in the development of CRISPR. Philippe Horvath was another scientist who investigated CRISPR in dairy cultures in 2007. John van der Oost first programmed CRISPR defense systems in 2008. And Sylvain Moineau proved that CRISPR targeted specific points when cutting DNA sequences.